Hello out there. We are on the air. It's Saturday night tonight, November 20th, 2021. 2021. We're almost at the end of 2021. Do you remember when this around this time last year and people were saying, man, I can't wait till 2021 is over or 2020 is over. What a year. Yeah, it was the year, right? <clears throat> Boy, I, I what I wouldn't give to be back in 2020 right now. <laughs> That's how things are going, right? That's how things are going. So just to um, actually, first of all, uh, as I mentioned, the date is uh, November 20th, 2021, Saturday night. I am your host, Rick Rockwell. Uh, go ahead, hit the like, hit the subscribe. This is Stranger in a Strange Land because we are living in strange times. And wherever you go now, you are a stranger and the land is becoming uh, increasingly strange, right? And that is the situation we find us in, find ourselves in out here in British Columbia. <clears throat> so what's happened? Well, I was, um, I was making a joke. Well, it wasn't a joke, but I, I was making an observation last week to uh, one of my colleagues. We were talking on one of the Zoom meetings that we have. And I said to him, <clears throat> I said, you know, there isn't a week that goes by where there isn't a bomb that goes off in my lap, so to speak. Like when I get out of bed and I start the week, something is going wrong, right? And the problem is so much of this stuff is man-made and is exasperated by poor decisions, um, you know, that have a knock-on effect as I've covered ad nauseum. If you go back to the early, um, early episodes of the COVID Chronicles, you will see that I predicted, I predicted that worse than the virus itself, uh, all of the actions that were taken were going to have knock-on effects. You're going to see a tsunami of businesses going out of business, and that's been happening, and it's going to continue to happening, happen. <clears throat> You're going to learn very quickly or very slowly or very painfully, whatever it is, that you cannot simply shut off businesses and then start them up again. And, you know, all these measures that are taken in place simply by governments that just don't have a clue what to do, so they copy another government. And the reason they do this, I know I'm kind of getting ahead of the, the theme and the topic of the show tonight, but let me just let me just rant and grieve a little bit, right? <clears throat> so what we see is we see governments around the world imitating other governments. Why do they do that? Uh, I used to think maybe it was some puppet master kind of pulling the strings. And you know what? Those people are out there. They do have influence. They, um, you know, they offer input and they have an agenda and they push it through, right? But more often than not, I really think that these governments just imitate other governments. That way, if something goes wrong, it goes wrong everywhere and you can't identify them. Whereas if a government or some health collective or whatever was to try something, you know, innovative and novel, maybe a little bit risky, but with a lot of potential upside uh, and it doesn't work out, then they look like the idiot that went away from conventional wisdom, right? They defy the experts. So that's why we see the same things everywhere. <clears throat> and in one of the previous videos, I talked about, you know, leaving Canada. But where the hell would you go? Where would you go to not experience pretty much all the same things? Well, I guess that was the case up until last week. And when I said a bomb goes off in my lap, ooh, it was a doozy last week, or I should say the beginning of this week, Monday. So to take you into my world, uh, anybody that lives in BC, should be accustomed to rain. Um, as far as major cities go, BC gets, you know, I don't know if it would be the top. I'm sure some countries that have monsoon seasons would probably eclipse BC. But as far as major cities go, Vancouver is probably pretty close to the top in terms of annual rainfall, particularly in the fall and winter months. So that has been the case here. It has been raining continuously, 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 which in itself is kind of depressing and kind of demoralizing, but not unexpected. However, Monday morning, I woke up as I often do, gazed lovingly over at Mrs. Rockwell, got out of bed, uh, got my little dog, Troy, and went out to the backyard, as we often do. I take him out in the backyard. I breathe in the fresh air. I contemplate the events of the, the day before and what I'll be doing today. But this time when I stepped out, I stepped ankle deep into flowing water. Now, uh, that's not a good sign, considering there's never water in my backyard. I don't live on a lake. Uh, I don't live on a river. I live in a, a subdivision in between two other houses. 
and the entire backyard here. You can see some pictures. So these are some pictures from in and around my place and in and around the community. You can see uh, water overflowing through my driveway, through the back of my house, and it started seeping into uh, my daughter's bedroom as well. So needless to say, uh, whatever I had planned for Monday, that was put on hold as me and the rest of the crew feverishly began working to uh, divert water from outside, to put up barriers to stop it from flooding the house. Um, the whole time I just kept thinking, God, how much is this gonna cost me? But the long story short, we did manage to save our house from significant damage, I would say. I mean, a few carpets are, uh, are not gonna make it. They had to get thrown out. You know, you get that kind of swampy water smell and that's taken a little bit of work to get out. Uh, my old and number one daughter had to evacuate her room for the night and sleep up on the couch, but she was okay with that. She kind of just rolls with the punches. We got the water out of her room and things are more or less back to normal. Um, but the same cannot be said for the rest of the province. So in a province that gets continual rain every year, you would think that a heavy rainfall would not be surprising. Well, uh, I guess this surprised everybody. I guess it was so much rain that it was completely unaccounted for um, and completely overwhelmed a variety of safe measures. So <clears throat> we've had the town of Hope, which is a, a town about, uh, I guess it's about an hour and a half east of Vancouver along the Trans-Canada Highway and sort of right into the start of the mountains. And it's uh, had a bridge washed out on one side of it and a road washed out on the western side of it. So it's essentially cut off. It's essentially cut off from the interior of the province and it's essentially cut off from the coast of the province. We've had the town of Merritt, which is almost like a waypoint between the Fraser Valley and the Okanagan. You go up the Coquihalla Highway, you hit Merritt, and then from Merritt you can go straight on to Kamloops or you can divert off to Kelowna, which are Kamloops is in the Caribou and Kelowna is in the Okanagan. But anyways, enough with the geography lesson. So this entire town of Merritt has had to have been evacuated. Of course, people have stayed, but anyways, so that's what's been going on. And floods in themselves are bad. Um, but what's really, really bad is, number one, what I suspect, I mean, of course, you know, the climate change agenda is going to come out, right? And, you know, they're sort of the first ones to kind of gin up the populace and say, oh, there you go. You know, this is what happens. You can expect this, right? Um, but is it that? It could be, right? I'm not saying it's not. Uh, but it also could be a complete um, failure to prepare for these sort of things. And maybe you can't. You know, I, this is where I would have to defer to an expert. You know, some things are common sense, some things you do have to defer to an expert, and maybe there is no amount of preparation or preparedness or contingency that you can put in place to keep a, um, a road from washing out if there's a heavy enough rain. Maybe that is absolutely impossible to stop. I don't know. Um, but like I said, I mean, this is the first time in my life this has happened, and the rain leading up to this event, sure, it seemed heavy, but it didn't seem anything unusual. I, I don't recall saying to myself, wow, I've never seen rain this heavy before. Hang on, I just uh, I just have to let somebody know. Sorry for this brief interlude. Yeah. Got my boy Darren coming in. So yeah, so that's the situation. But now what's really the problem here is over the last year and a half going on two years, um, we have continuously All right, well, sorry for that brief interlude. Uh, I just had a, a brief interruption from a, a very persistent guy, but hey, it's all good now. So where was I? Uh, so yeah, okay, so <clears throat> BC is a province that gets a lot of rain, always has, and it always will, you know, at least far, far into the future. Now, I can understand the fire situation taking people off guard, although there has been a lot of forest fires 
uh, the last few years. But rain, rain should not take anybody in this province by surprise, right? Right, Darren? I know. No. And so, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I mean, it does seem to me that you could take a lot of preparations uh, for key infrastructure like roads, like bridges, um, and like uh, pump stations and all of that stuff. I mean, <clears throat> what are we paying the carbon tax for? We get quite heavily taxed on gas here. Should it not be going towards stuff just like this? Preventative measures, you know, safety measures to make sure things like this don't happen. So as it currently stands, uh, these floods have completely cut us off from the rest of the country. So any products that come into the port of Vancouver can't get out now. They have to go down through the states. Anything from Eastern Canada can't get through to Vancouver. <laughs> one road is out and one bridge is out and that's pretty much all it took. Sorry, Vancouver, you're out. That's it, you're done. Congratulations. <clears throat> so anyways, that's, that's what's happened here, right? And the reason I say the collapse has started, the collapse all actually started back in March of 2020. But like most things, there's, you know, there's a famous saying, uh, I don't know who said it, so I can't quote the person directly, but he was asked, um, what was it like going bankrupt? Or how did you go bankrupt? And he said, very slowly and then all at once. And I think that's pretty much the trajectory that every collapse takes. Uh, it starts off slowly, it chips away because you have a strong edifice, a, a, a fairly good foundation, but eventually you get to the tipping point where a little bit of pressure and things really start to crumble. And I think that's where we're getting to now. I think we're gonna see more and more infrastructure failures. We're already seeing supply chain failures. I have probably $100,000 in product in BC that I can't get out to the rest of the province. And I have other warehouses holding products uh, back east that can't make deliveries out here. That's it, it's just ground to a halt. And this is all on top of the global worldwide shortages. So this, these are how these things come and how they capsize, uh, you know, companies, societies, communities, businesses, whatever, right? It's, you can only take so much of a certain situation and you start, it's like death by a thousand cuts. One little thing here, sure, you can deal with small problems. Can you deal with five small problems? Maybe. Can you deal with 10 small problems and then a big problem? Probably not, right? So anyways, here's a quick look at um, some of the reaction on some of these things that are happening, right? So the port of Vancouver closes. So now the port of Vancouver has closed as well. Flooding damages rails and roads. And you can see, there we go. There's a bridge that's gone out. Now, once again, I mean, I know there was a lot of water. I know there was a lot of rain. But should this stuff not be accounted for? Like, I, I suspect, and I could be wrong, if there's somebody out there that knows this stuff a lot better than me, absolutely, I will defer to you. But I suspect there has been some negligence in certain things, in, in drainage or infrastructure. That's what I suspect. Again, just speculation on my part. Um, this is a look from space. So if you're an alien and you're looking to come down to Vancouver, you might say, meh, I'll pass. Yeah, that's the same one. Darren's cousin Darren is showing it to me right now. NASA. Yeah, thanks, NASA. We knew it was a problem. Uh, and oh, finally, yeah. So and finally, from the narwhal, how to build back BC's flood infrastructure better. Build back better. So we got it. So it's it's not enough that we got to put up with all this bullshit. Now we have to get these idiots out here with their catchphrases again. Build back better. So what's this going to mean now, right? What's this going to mean? Is there going to be some kind of sustainability criteria? I mean, I'm all for sustainability, but is there going to be a bunch of is there going to be a political agenda jammed in here? Are we going to have to consult with every minority group under the sun to make sure that? everything is copacetic with them. Can we not just build something properly? That's how you build back better. You construct something properly and you construct it with all these contingencies planned out ahead of time. And even if there is a contingency that you haven't planned for, you have a backup plan, right? So, I mean, that's, that's the initial response to the flood. Um, actually, hang on, let me just 
yeah, let's let's gas these guys here in their build back better bullshit. So, but the fun has not the fun has not stopped at the flood. So many people remember early on in the um, in the health crisis, there was some hoarding going on. Do you remember that? Do you remember that, Darren? Uh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Everybody remembers, yeah. right? I didn't buy nothing. I yeah. Didn't care. Yeah. It it well, called for the bullshit. Yeah, you just were willing to kind of sit there and die, right? <clears throat> but yeah, so I mean, it's, um, hey, if it wasn't obvious before then, it's obvious now, right? When you come out with these kind of draconian sort of measures, right? People tend to panic. People tend to read into the situation. And a lot of people get on uh, someone for hoarding. And you know what? If you're hoarding to make a profit out of it, then yeah, you're a real dick. But if you're hoarding because you have no fucking clue when you're ever going to be able to get something again, I kind of understand. But anyways, our, our good friends in the government haven't learned this lesson. So what has happened? Uh, well, yesterday, just about 24 hours ago, actually, um, the minister in BC, who was it? Was it Farnsworth? I think it was, yeah, public safety minister Mike Farnsworth came out and said they're going to limit fuel to 30 liters per visit. Okay. Now, again, getting back to my point on infrastructure, and see, Darren, cousin Darren, and my grandfather worked at a refinery, didn't he? Worked at a Shell refinery in Burnaby. And back then, there used to be three refineries in the lower mainland, but now there's only one. We only have one refinery now. So that kind of puts you in a vulnerable situation with something like fuel, doesn't it? And now, of course, we're cut off from Alberta, so we're not getting any fuel there. And so this guy, this idiot, yeah, you're an idiot, Mike Farnsworth, he comes out and says, uh, we're going to be limiting gas to 30 liters per person per fill up uh, for the next 10 days. And we all know it won't be 10 days. So cut that shit all the same all this, oh, as well, right? So he comes out with that statement. And what happens eight hours later? Some BC gas stations already selling out as drivers react to rationing order. So the exact opposite of what he wanted to happen, happened. He wanted people to be very stingy and very careful and very slight with their gas usage, right? To preserve it. So he comes out with this fear mongering statement. Oh, we're cut off from gas. We're gonna ration gas. And of course people flock in their droves. And if you've gone by a gas station and I'll, I'll, I'll post some video here because I took one. Uh, good luck getting in and getting any gas right now. How long will this go on? Who knows? He says it's 10 days. I don't have enough gas to last for 10 days unless I walk everywhere. Um, but yeah, so I mean, the <laughs> you just, what kind of people do we got running this place, right? Like he gets the exact opposite response of what he wanted to happen. So, and now, of course, you may have seen this earlier, there is confusion. Confusion reigns. Uh, Uber and Lyft are not considered essential under new BC gas restrictions. Okay, so, I mean, if you used an Uber or a Lyft to get to work, or if you drive an Uber, hey, sorry, you're out of work for the next 10 days. Too bad, right? And that's how that went down. So, there you go. Um, yes, I think pretty clearly we are in the early stages of a collapse. Now, does that mean next week we're gonna be hunting people in the forest for food? No, uh, maybe the gas rationing will stop in two weeks. I, I very unlikely that it'll stop in 10 days, like he said, but then we'll have three weeks of maybe fewer problems, but then something else will happen. There, will, I guarantee you there will be some other catastrophe that happens in the next three months. And catastrophes are gonna be unavoidable and ongoing because there's just an overall weakening of society, right? There's a weakening of infrastructure, there's less of a community spirit, more of an every man for himself type of attitude, and all of these things feed on each other, right? And soon the transportation industry and the consumer package industry are probably the next, what's up, next ones on the chopping block. Not everybody is getting products, right? So let's stay tuned, right? Um, Sorry, sorry to give you kind of a black pill going into the holiday season 
I'll see if I can come back next week with something bright and cheery. Maybe we'll have a nice blue sky. Maybe the gas rationing will be over. Maybe all the virus restrictions will be done. Maybe we'll have a clear path of our future, right? Right. Maybe that could happen within the next couple of weeks. Do you think it will? I don't care. Darren doesn't care. See, Darren's checked out. Darren's demoralized. He's nihilistic. He doesn't care what happens. He doesn't care if there's food on the shelves. He doesn't care if there's gas in the I car. He just wants to get high, man, and <laughs> live out his days, right? Well, I wish I could take that attitude, but I don't have quite the freedom that Darren does. So it is what it is. Anyways, until next time, uh, hey, take it easy, man. <laughs> All right.